everybody, welcome to another video. Hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video, I'm gonna talk about how to graph a cosine function. We're gonna graph the parent function, y equals cosine x, and then we'll graph a harder, more complicated example using transformations. So graphing cosine functions is very similar to graphing sine functions, and I already have a very detailed video on graphing sine functions. You can click right up here if you'd like to watch that. But yeah, they are very similar, and in fact, what's pretty cool is that any sine function can be expressed as a cosine function and vice versa. Usually all you have to do is apply a phase shift and you can rewrite sine as cosine and vice versa. It's pretty cool, and we'll see how that works in just a second once I graph this parent function. But yeah, look at this general formula. I mean, it's the same as our formula for sine, other than we have cosine. That's the only thing that changes between sine and cosine. This amplitude is still the same, period, phase shift, vertical shift, all this information is still the same, which is pretty nice because it's consistent between sine and cosine, you know? So our period, for our parent function, it's two pi, so when we have some number being multiplied out here in front of the x, we just divide 2 pi by whatever that number is to find our new period. Pretty much the technique and the strategy for graphing cosine and sine are the same. So let's go and graph this parent function and we can do so by just plotting points. So I can pick x's and plug them in and see what the y is, right? And I'm going to be smart about this because I want values that I know, that I don't need a calculator because we're graphing all these functions without using a calculator. So I know what the cosine of 0 is. I know pi over 2. I know pi. I know 3 pi over 2. And I know 2 pi. Okay, so hopefully you all can see all the way down there. So what is the cosine of 0? Well, if you notice, these are all quadrantal angles, which means they lie on one of the axes, all right? So zero is actually right here, and this is what I always do to evaluate any quadrantal angle, and I think about what is my x, y, and r, and I use the definition of cosine, which is x over r. So in this case, my x is one, my r is one if I think of the unit circle, right? And even if my r is something else, x and r are always going to be equal, right? Think about it. r is that distance from the center, so they're always gonna be equal. So even if you don't think about it in terms of the unit circle, it's pretty clear to see that cosine is one, okay? So what about up here at pi over two? This time my x is zero, cosine is zero. Down here at pi, my x is negative one, cosine is negative one. Three pi over two, that's down here. That means my x is back to zero, cosine is zero there. Two pi, well that's the same value I get when I, get, when I plug in zero to this function. So I'm back at one. So as you can see, it's a very similar pattern that sine has, where we have sort of this oscillation about the x-axis, right? But instead of starting at zero, zero, like a sine function does, I start at zero, one. So I'm gonna draw that first point up here, okay? And then at pi over two, I go down to zero. And then at pi, I go down to negative one. So I'm trying to draw a pretty accurate graph here. And then I go back up to zero. Then I go up to one again. So I'm up here. And again, we don't just draw a straight line. This isn't a V, like some kind of absolute value function or something. This is a wave, just like a sine wave. We also have a cosine wave. So let's see, I have a wave down this way. And then I'm curving down and up. And this is not perfect, I apologize, but this is as good as I can do for now. All right, so it looks a little something like this, the parent function for cosine. And this is one period, right? The period is length of two pi. If I wanted to label all these, this is two pi, three pi over two pi. This is zero, right? And I could even extend this. I mean, it keeps going forever. So I can extend this down over here. I could extend this down over here. It's just gonna keep going forever. So let's notice the difference. Remember I said that Cosine can be written as sine by just applying a phase shift. So let's think about if I shifted this over to the right and I could shift it over to the right pi over two units, right? If I shift it to the right by pi over two, then this point moves to here and now I'm starting at zero, zero. Then I'm going up and then back down and then it's actually the same as y equals sine x. So I can just apply a basic shift to this cosine function and it becomes the parent function for sine, which is pretty cool. So this is the parent function and we're gonna use transformations to graph a little harder of an example. All right, let's use some transformations to graph this cosine function. I encourage you to pause the video on your own, try this, 
press play to check your answer. So let's go ahead and start. What I like to do first is just write out everything I know, basically gather a bunch of information about this function. So I know the amplitude is just the absolute value of a negative two, which is just positive two. Amplitude is always positive. Amplitude equals two. Okay, what else do I know? Let's see. Well, this negative, we don't just ignore it. This negative, what it actually means is a reflection. Okay, it's a reflection. And what I like to call it is a reflection over the midline. So the midline for sine and cosine, which is basically what the functions oscillate about, normally it's the line y equals zero. The x-axis, right, is the midline. But when we add vertical shifts, the midline changes. So that's why I like to think of the reflection as a reflection over the midline. Because if you think of it as over the x-axis and then you have vertical shifts, a lot of students get confused. So... Just reflection over the midline, that's how I like to think of it. Reflection over midline. What is my period? Well, I just divide two pi by this number out here being multiplied to the x. So my period becomes two pi over two, which is just pi. Period is pi. What else? Let's see, period is pi. I do have a phase shift. My phase shift is not pi over four. Remember, I have to divide by the number out here in front of the x. And the reason why, in case you wanted a justification for why we do that, and a lot of instructors even teach this way, is that you factor out whatever's in front of the x being multiplied, you factor out, and what are you left with? x plus pi over eight. Look what happens, when I plug this two back in, I get right back to where I was. This makes it pretty convincing that the shift is not pi over four, but it's pi over eight, right? And I would get this as well by just dividing by the number out in front of the x. But this is a nice little justification as to why we divide. So let's see, phase shift, phase shift. And I personally like to write which direction we're shifting, okay? Some instructors teach that when you shift to the right, you write it as positive, and when you shift to the left, you write it as negative, and you just write the number. But I, I like to write it, phase shift left, pi over eight. Okay, what else do we have left? We've done the period, phase shifts. Okay, yeah, this vertical shift. So how I like to think of this, again, normally our midline is at y equals zero, or it's the x-axis. I like to think of these vertical shifts shifting the midline. So my new midline is at y equals one instead of y equals zero. So vertical shift, all right, vertical shift and I'll just write plus one. We know that it's up one unit, right? So we're shifting up one unit, which means I'm now here, and this is my new midline. I normally draw a dotted line at my midline because I know that this is what I am now oscillating about, okay? So let's go ahead and start, you know, drawing this graph, basically. What I like to start with is the first point because usually with these examples for exams and quizzes and stuff, you're asked to graph, graph one period or graph two periods. And a period is basically a full cycle, right? Um, so our period in this case is pi. But where are we starting? Normally we start at zero, right? Normally sine and cosine, we start at zero. We go to two pi. But now we have this phase shift. So this is where I always start. I start with the midline, then I consider the phase shift. Since we're shifting left pi over eight, my first point is not going to be at zero. It's going to be left at negative pi over eight negative pi over eight, right? That's gonna be my first point because we're shifted, okay? Now let's think about this, the period. Again, this is the length from the starting point to the end point for one full cycle. So the length from this negative pi over eight to whatever this final point is, is pi. So what can I do? I can add pi to negative pi over eight and I will get seven pi over eight. So I kind of did that in my head, but you could get a common denominator and do it off to the side if you wanted, but. 7 pi over 8. So a lot of instructors call these critical points, and this is how I was personally taught to graph these, is first sketch the midline, dotted line, then find the first critical point, then find the highest critical point by just adding whatever the period is. How can I find the middle one? Remember there's five. Think about the parent function. 0 pi over 2 pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. Five critical points. So how can I find this middle point? Well, I can basically take the average of these two points. I can add them and divide by two. Sometimes it is more obvious. If you have something like pi and two pi, 
that, that may be more obvious, you know what I mean? But in this case, I'm just gonna add them and divide by two. So I have negative pi over eight plus seven pi over eight, that's six pi over eight. Divided by two, that is three pi over eight. And I could do the scratch work off to the side, but I trust that y'all know how to add fractions. Especially it's nice since they already have the common denominator. It's not too bad at all. So this is three pi over eight. So how can I find my last two critical points? Exactly how I found this middle one. I add these two and divide by two. That's gonna be three pi over eight plus seven pi over eight. That's 10 pi over eight divided by two. And you may even notice the pattern. Three, seven, so the five must be in there, right? It's gonna be five pi over eight. So five pi over eight is here. And what do we have here? Negative pi over eight plus three pi over, pi over eight. That's two pi over eight divided by two. That's just pi over eight. So pi over eight. And I'm drawing these, I'm labeling these points now, but it's a little tricky because, again, my line could get in the way. I may have to erase some of these and kind of move them around. I don't know yet exactly where my points are going to be. So let's think about it. I have shown the vertical shift by moving the midline. I've shown the phase shift. I've shown my period by labeling all my points. So now I just need to consider the amplitude. Where is my maximum and where is my minimum? And that's how I prefer to think of sine and cosine right? Cosine, instead of thinking of it as, oh, cosine starts at one, I think of it as cosine starts at its maximum. And that tends to avoid errors if you think of it that way, at least for me personally. So since cosine starts at its maximum, our midline is y equals one and our amplitude is two. Amplitude is the distance from the midline to the maximum and the distance from the midline to the minimum, right? So going from the midline here at y equals one, I'm going up two units and that is my new maximum, okay? So I'm going up one, two units. That is my maximum. And then to get to my minimum, I'm going down one, two units. So I'm down here, okay? So again, cosine normally starts at its maximum, which will be here at negative pi over eight, three, but what's happening? Remember, reflection over the midline. And this is why I say over the midline and not over the line, uh, the x-axis, because a lot of students would go here, they go to three and they say, oh, reflect over the x-axis. Let me go to negative three, which would actually be incorrect. You're actually gonna be down here at the minimum, which is at negative one, okay? So now I'm starting at the minimum, so I will have to move this out of the way because I'm starting here at negative pi over eight, negative one right here and I'll just move my label to here and draw it a little smaller. So I'm starting there. But now it follows the same pattern, right? I'm oscillating, I'm going, my next point, my next critical point is gonna be at the midline. And this is what's cool about labeling my own points is I have a lot of freedom. And, and once I get to this point, once I get to this part of graphing, it's, it's straightforward. Because then I'm moving to the midline, my next critical point is at the maximum. So way up here, then I'm back down to the midline, then my next critical point is back to the minimum, and this would be one full cycle, one period for this function. Let me just connect these dots, so I can draw my curves here, my curve here, my curve here. These are not perfect, but that might be as good as it's going to get for me. And this is one cycle, this is one period of this function. We use transformations to find it. So again, there are a lot of different ways that teachers teach how to do this and that people do this. Do whatever makes sense for you. I'm just showing you the way I do it that makes sense for me. And I'm able to graph, especially sine and cosine, pretty well and pretty uh, accurately by using this method. So I hope this helped everybody. I may make some more videos on tangent, cotangent, and even some more examples with sine and cosine using transformations. So hit like, hit subscribe if you enjoy. Leave any questions below. Keep flexing those brain muscles. I'll see you in the next video.